Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy Angel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. Troy, I am excited for uh, another episode, another uh, v- episode of our famous series, Revived Conversations. <laughs> Uh, famous being we've had two so far, but it, they've been pretty well received. We've got a lot of good feedback yeah. about these conversations. People have been telling us they really like it, and so it was a good idea to put out an episode that I think will cause a lot of problems <laughs> and lose all the goodwill that we earned with the last sure, one. Sure, sure. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it. it is a lot of fun. It's been something that we've kind of talked about, because Troy and I had these conversations all the time off the air, and uh, we've always been like, it'd be great to rec- record these conversations um, and we didn't quite know how, but then we thought, you know, we'll just we'll just kind of sprinkle them in throughout the Revive Thoughts lineup here, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you guys have seen the title of the episode that you clicked on, Unity in the Church. This was this was one that Troy suggested, uh, and this is something that we talk about quite a bit. It comes up on Revive Thoughts quite a bit, too, because there are a lot of church leaders that either are trying to help divisions in the church or inadvertently causing divisions in the church or avertently causing divisions in the church. Um, and it's something that the Bible takes incredibly seriously. There's there is so many, there's dozens of verses and passages throughout the Bible uh, that make it very clear that we are supposed to not be divided in the church and that those who do that are opposing the church and opposing God. Uh, and so it's something that, frankly, you know, I, I I think people need to take more seriously than a lot of the issues that Christians seem to fixate on in today's day and age. But we have some discussions about this. And, and Troy, I, I, I'm going to let you, uh, I know what your opening argument is going to be. I know what your statement is going to be. And I know I have maybe a little bit of pushback on that. So I want you to uh, kind of take it away and uh, introduce us to kind of some thoughts you have about that. Okay, so first thing I'm going to say is if you start to hear this and it sounds weird, just kind of stick with me for a minute, but think about this for a minute, because I find that Christianity and Christians in general, Bible believers and and wonderful people from different branches of Christianity, actually, in fact, one of the interesting things about both Revive Thoughts, Revive Devos, and Martyrs and Missionaries is our studio, because it's a church history focus, has a lot of people from different denominations, people who would not maybe necessarily sit at the same table together, uh, all kinds of different, I won't go into all the details and just be like, you're this, this, and this, but I'm just saying that this show is, you're listening to it and thinking it's one kind of show, and you might even be trying to, you know, pigeonhole and figure out what kind of theology, I've had people tell us like they're trying to figure out what theology you and I have, Joel. Um, and it might not be what you think it is. We've been accused from, you know, all different sides of being supporters of the other side too. It's really interesting to me. So the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of people listening, coming at this from different perspectives and this show appeals to that. But one thing I have noticed that seems to be common almost to everybody is kind of this idea, this almost imaginary idea from the Catholics have kind of have this idea if I, if I might be so bold, but others do too that at one point the church was united, that it was this unified being, and then it just started to break down into pieces, especially because of the Protestant Reformation. Now, obviously, the Catholic Church supports this because, you know, they're not big fans of the Pre- Protestant Reformation. They kind of don't care for it. And so in their mind, view, their, you know, their worldview, everything was going pretty well until you guys started splitting off in every direction. I understand where they're coming from. <laughs> But I run into a lot of Protestants who kind of have the same view, and they might not say it. They would probably say that they think their view is correct and all the other ones that have split off are wrong, and then they will complain. I mean, if you've never heard this and you live in America, I don't know where you live, but if you've never heard anybody say, one of the problems with the church today is we have too many denominations, and it's true. We have, I think, at least like it's thousands on the books. I mean, there is a lot of denominations and that's not including the churches that just go, eh, we're non-denominational. So we're not, you know, we're going to subscribe to certain beliefs, but we're not going to pick a team here. There, And this is seen basically as this idea, This the problem I think with this idea that I don't like, that I want to push back from a historical perspective is this idea that at one point everything was united and then we just started dividing and dividing and dividing over everything. And that's where I just want to say, historically, I think you're getting it wrong. I think you're getting a little bit too simple of a message. Did the Catholic Church 
have a strong grip over parts of Europe, especially right before the Protestant Reformation. Absolutely it did. But the Catholic Church has never been the only church in the game. There has always been other groups. I mean, pretty much since the very early days of the church, there have been other pieces of the church that have always been kind of out there doing things. Now, most people, when they hear that, they go, oh yeah, like the Nestorians, the Church of the Far East, that's the Nestorians. That would be kind of an incorrect view, though. Most scholars have gone through, have looked at the theologians like Abbi the Great. If you don't know him, you maybe look into him. He's really interesting. He basically helped write a lot of the theology that the Syriac and those churches out there in the Middle East and beyond would believe and follow. And actually, it's quite Trinitarian, and it's not nearly as heretical as most people believe. There are Nestorians that were out there, but there were plenty who were not just complete heretics, too. And those people managed to scatter quite a long ways. We have found records of them in China. They certainly were there. They were in the courts of, you know, Genghis Khan as well. Of course, at that point, it had kind of broken down theologically, and it wasn't the same as what the West believed really anymore. But there are even evidence that they may have made it as far out as Malaysia as well. So they were all around the world. But even before that, there was also the Egyptian Coptic Church, the Syriac Church, the Armenian Church, the Ethiopian Church, um, and other groups among there. Those, all those groups existed while the Catholic Church was dominant. And the main thing that they split over was the idea that where the Chalcedonians would say, you know, Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God, and those are two, two separate natures in one person, these churches would have said, oh, we can't, you know, we don't agree with that. We believe that Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God, and that was one nature. Now, is it a big deal? Yes, absolutely. But they were reading, you know, the same scriptures, and they were still saying Jesus was God and man. I don't know how many of us today would refuse to break bread over that. And some of you are theological types and theologian types, and you absolutely would. But I don't know how many laymen would break communion off for that difference and how many of us would be willing to say that for example the coptic christians that were killed by muslim terrorists are willing to say that those were not real martyrs for the faith at least some of them right and and so and even martin luther quite respected the ethiopian church which would have held to this claim a lot of the reformers respected the ethiopian church and have quoted the ethiopian church and they would have held to this claim they split over you know, theological lines in the early, early centuries of the church, things that we necessarily don't, we don't really know if we go there every time. This is not to say very carefully, let me mind you, that these theological issues are not important or that these theological issues don't really matter because I can think of a church that is very common in America that has some very, you know, would, would be theologically a bit askew, the Church of Mormon, yet they would say they claim to the Christian faith as well. So, I mean, there is some issues here, and we do need to know who the person of Christ is and how he is God. But even inside of the Catholic realm, it was never fully one thing or the other. There were the Hussites, there were the people of Flanders, there were um, the Wycliffe followers, there were um, the, the Irish church itself was never fully aligned with the Catholic church. It kind of always did its own thing. It had its own practices, had its own holidays, kind of was a little bit different than the Catholic church. Some go as far as to say it was distinct and completely its own church, the Irish church, and others would say, no, it wasn't distinct. It was kind of a part of the Catholic church because they still like the Pope, but it was very, no one really knows, and different centuries had it at different levels of differentiation. Again, also, we have to take into account countries. Spain viewed the Catholic Church very different than England did, which viewed it very differently than the northern places where the Vikings still ruled and the Catholic Church was just barely breaking in. This idea of unity, this idea that there was once just everything was one way, and then we just started dividing and dividing and dividing, is just not, I don't think, accurate to history, and it skips over history and makes the church, it, it creates this imaginary idea of the church and what it was, and it, it just never was that. There have always been Anabaptists, or I mean, well, not always been Anabaptists, but there have always been like these different types of groups viewing things differently, wrestling, arguing, and being theological. And, and if I could say one more thing in this very long monologue, um, there's one more thing to consider, too, that I just don't think is in the team. We always we have to reunite. We have to be, you know, ecumenical. We need to just put aside the biggest problem with the church today is we have too many differences is 
there are real heretics and there are real problem causers. And like I mentioned with the Church of Mormon, there are real groups who claim to be Christian that aren't. And to let them in does really damage the church. In East Asia right now, there are several cults that swoop in on new believers in Korea and in China. And it's a really big problem for them because these people claim to be Christians. They claim to have special knowledge of Christ and they purposely aim for new believers, pull them in or pull people who are kind of wavering on their faith in and they trick them into believing something that's not. And there's no uniting with these groups. These are real cults. And that causes a problem if we just say, well, we need to unite all the time. And well, we need to all have, you know, give everyone a shot. And there was once a united church and now there's not. And we need to get back to that place. There, It almost obscures the fact that part of the reason we divided was for real reasons. I think it's so weird that you took that, like, that's what your initial approach is to the concept of of unity i i mean i it's it's awesome i love that our minds are different and that i mean obviously i i feel like you're taking a more not like you mentioned a, a church history historical almost like geographical analysis of different uh <laughs> yeah divisions throughout the time i feel like we need to kind of subcategorize what we mean by unity because i feel like they like what you're talking about almost falls into a different category than what I think of when I think of unity in the church. I totally, I don't know, say if I agree. I mean, I, I think I do agree. I think so. There, the, the concept of people looking at scripture and coming up with, uh, and, and talking about what they think these scriptures mean, you know, like by nature of humanity and who we are and us having independent minds and us having creativity, you know, I'm big on creativity. Um, I think denominations, uh, you know, and I'm using the word denominations because I feel like that's an easy thing for us to cling on to, but people looking at scripture and going, oh, I think this means that, or are they, I think this means that. I think that's normal. I think that, I think that's unavoidable. I think that's a byproduct of being human. Humans are creative. Humans have their own thoughts, but I don't think that the argument and approach with unity necessarily falls on how many different types of denominations are. I think the conversation is more so around how do we interact with people around us that might have different beliefs than us or might. Who we disagree with, I guess, is, is maybe a polite way to say that. That, to me, is what all of these passages in the New Testament are talking about, is, is don't cause strife, don't cause divisions in the church, don't cause quarrels in the church. I mean, a lot of those passages are applying to people within the same church itself, you know, that maybe have the same belief structure. Okay, so what I think is interesting is even when I was just doing, you know, research and prep for this show, you know, when you're talking about something this important and you're talking about, you know, nature of God and, you know, who Jesus Christ is, you don't want to accidentally say this group is super solid and this group is super not. I mean, I do want to emphasize this is not a theologians mm. podcast and you are free to disagree with us and we're not saying if you don't, you're out. We're, what we're saying is just kind of look at the history of different groups and what we see them interacting and how scholars have looked at this and that kind of going back and forth. Without with with one hundred percent saying we may have something wrong. You may be like, hey, I come from an Armenian church family, and how dare you? You know, blah blah blah. I don't know. So don't don't get super mad at us. We're just trying to take a broad scope here. But what I'm trying to say is this idea of this idea of unity. I, th I think we kind of mistake this idea that the church will just all get along together, mm -hmm. and suddenly we'll just everything will be perfect if we could just let go of our divisive natures and just kind of freely give in, or you know, quit holding to doctrine, or quit holding to these you know concepts and holding to our names. I'm Baptist. I'm Presbyterian. And these are the things that cause us all these divisions. And if we just stop doing all that and just that I'm a you know follower of the Lord or something like that, I don't know what whatever it is that these kind of camps, these different groups kind of come to the idea, then we would suddenly see this fresh air breathe through everything. And there is some truth to that and the idea of like, yes, at the end of the day, following and pursuing Jesus Christ and the scriptures are the most important things. And letting go, I think, of this fan fantasy idea that the reason the church is in pain today, the church, the church has struggles today, is because she's divided. As if there was some time we can go back to when she wasn't. Mm. 
as if there was some magical portal back to, you know, a certain time in the 1800s or a certain time in the 1700s or a certain time in the 1600s when almost everyone believed the same way. And maybe if you're not Catholic, which most, I don't think most of our listeners are, and you're Protestant and you go, well, when we were all, you know, Puritans or something like that, there is no magical portal where we can go back to a time where the majority of any group was really any group. They've always been kind of in conflict, I guess. I don't think that's what... You could take a... I don't think that's what people are talking about, though, in today's age, when they talk about wanting the American church or the global church to be more unified. I think they're talking about not dying on those, like getting along with, with fellow churches around But see, you. ah, ah. Yes, and that's exactly it. So if we can lose the notion that there is a perfect church in the past where everyone got along, and we no longer are viewing it through this narrow focus of like that, and then we look around and realize it's okay for us to all, that it suddenly makes it okay for us all to have differences. And it makes it okay for us to start to go, okay, I'm, you know, so-and-so is, I don't know, an Anglican, and -and so-and-so is a Baptist. Where do we actually believe on the issues of Jesus Christ, because there are going to be some Anglicans who actually, though they claim to be Anglicans, may not actually believe in Jesus Christ or the Bible, just like there may be Baptists who, though they claim to be, you know, Jesus Christ followers, they might not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. Like, once we stop trying to make this idea that we can just kind of all perfect, once we are okay with the idea that we're going to have differences and there's going to, once we accept the idea that there are going to be divisions in the church based on what we believe we can i think start to start working on okay how do i work with others and how how much do i need to always be working with others is it okay if the baptists or the anglicans just do some stuff on their own and not always feel like they have to start uniting with other groups there are going to be times i think when the church does have to unite with other groups to do certain things there are certain things that only a big church can do and that might be um, something really big, like a maybe an earthquake relief. That might be something where you might have to reach across a, a denominational line and work together. But then there are other areas where, you know, you're just doing evangelism in your neighborhood. I, how much do you need to reach out to groups that aren't necessarily the same as you to I, do I that? Think, and why do you need to put that pressure on yourself? So so this is one of those things. And now, now we're getting into kind of like spiritual motivations, like, like uh, the supernatural element to the global church, right? I think this is one of those things to where if people are genuinely seeking God's will and genuinely uh, all in and fully surrendered to God's will and, and trying to serve God with all their heart, I think even if they have, you know, different interpretations of specific passages, which again, I think is normal for humans, um, that God will, align their motivations. I think that'd be one of the, one of those things. I mean, or, or or that those people shouldn't have necessarily issues serving side by side, breaking bed, bread with each other. I think that's yeah. kind of the unity that uh, we kind of see throughout that New Testament. I think so too. I think when you, and it just depends on your where you're at too. You and, you know, in the United States of America where there's a ton of different churches might be more careful who you unite with, especially because you're trying to think through who do I want to do ministry with? And there's a lot of different ministries maybe to choose from. And then when you're doing missionary work, you know, in Sudan or somewhere, you know, maybe Sudan's the wrong one to pick, but you know, one of these countries, because North Sudan would be where more specific, but in one of these countries where there's less Christians, right? You may not be so picky about who you're mm-hmm. working with because you might just want to be happy to work with who is ever on the ground. And that, they might think some things differently than you, but hey, we're just happy to get something going down there. The other thing to think about too is, um, I think about the 1800s, you know, we like the talk about the 1800s. You look at, let's take a character like Charles Spurgeon. He really respected the very uh, reformed, very Presbyterian style, high class um, Calvinism of Princeton. But he also was happy to work with other people um, around him that were Baptist as he was, or, you know, were maybe Anglican. Like he worked with a lot of different groups around him. He was most focused on Baptist because that's what he was, but he was also willing to work with all these other people around him. And yet, as we went, we went through the downgrade controversy, when it came down to an issue that he thought was and some people might not have even thought it, might have thought he was making too big a thing out of it. But when it came to an issue 
of high Christ importance, where he believed this continuing in this would be the compromise in Christ, even though he was working with his own group, the Baptists, and he could have seen himself as someone who stays in there and tries to fix things. That's when he decided to leave. So it's interesting that, oh, he's happy to work with other people of other groups and run, you know, rallies with D.L. Moody and stuff like that. Not a big deal. But when it came down to you know, something that would compromise his faith and being a part of a group that he thought was going to do that, that's when he steps out and steps away from that thing. Does that make sense? So like, sure. no, there's nothing wrong with reaching across to people, even that think dis- a little bit differently than you, but sometimes it's more important to make a stand inside your denomination or inside your own group. That's when you really have to make that And that's, stand. I think, the hard part for a lot of believers and a lot of church leaders in today's day and age is where do you draw that line? Like, what at what... At what point, and I mean, I'm going to probably sound like a broken record here for the rest of this episode, but I do feel like a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of this does, uh, there is a spiritual element to it. Like, like there, yes. it, it is a very difficult thing to get right. And I would dare say impossible without being yes. led by the spirit um, in that. Detroit, do you remember in Bible college, I remember... Uh, and I don't even remember what class it was, but I remember the professor made a chart on the marker board. Uh, it was a graph, right? You have two axes. You have the vertical axis and the horizontal mm-hmm. axis. And the vertical axis said, uh, how sure of you of this topic, or of your interpretation, rather. And then the horizontal mm-hmm. axis said, how important is it? And then you plot your your intersection between these two axes, and the higher it up, it gets to that top right corner, is is where you finally make your cutoff of you know this is yeah. what is worth standing on you know dying on that hill to 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 prove that point and the majority the vast majority of all the topics that we debate in class fall so low on that axis to where it's not it's not cutting that threshold of something that's worth arguing about of worth uh, defending um, in the midst of ministry in the midst of service yeah. I, I think so too. I guess if you ask me, because you at the beginning of the episode, you said this is such a weird approach to this. I think the reason this approach is important to me, the reason I wanted to open it from the church history perspective is because what I see a lot of people carrying, what I see a lot of things happening is either all the problems in the church today is because we divide or we should feel guilty because we're a divided church. And what I guess I'm trying to tell people is like, this is normal. <laughs> what we're experiencing is to some degree what the church has been experiencing for 2,000 so years. So normal doesn't that's mean not good. Abnormal. Normal doesn't mean healthy. You know, I, I don't think that this is, I think there's room for improvement I, I, both now and, and in, you know, all the previous generations. You say that this has always been a thing. That doesn't mean that it's always been the way that God wants the church to operate. Okay, but then I would also say I would I would I would point out I love how we sound like lawyers and your <laughs> honor I would say but no what I would what I, how I'd answer you is yes but how how to do it different like we're saying okay well this isn't good we can do better sure but are we going to say that we're smarter than the two thousand years and better and, and no I don't I don't think we are I think you nailed the he- nailed the hammer to the to the head of the nail when you Nailing said something. God is the only. Yeah, something ha- yeah, there was a hammer and some drills, let me tell you. And God is the only one who can unite the church. When, when Jesus Christ was praying the high priestly prayer in chapter 17 of John, he says, you know, let them be united. Let them be one as you and I are one. Let them have that oneness too, oneness with us and oneness, that whole oneness chapter. I don't, can't quote it verbatim and I don't want to mess it up, but he's saying, let them be as one as the Father and the Son are one. But he's asking and telling the Father to do that. That is something only God the Father can do. And us carrying guilt and us feeling bad and us going around going, the problem with the church today is that this, when it's never been this perfect church that we're imagining it to be, doesn't help the situation. What could help the situation is prayer. And what could help the situation is just genuine, you know, love and praying for it and asking God the same thing Jesus asked for, which is for us to be one, but just getting around and complaining about this thing, like we're the first church to be divided as if this hasn't been the way it's been the whole time, I think is a bit of a useless measure. It's a useless measure, but I don't, I mean, in our own spiritual walk, you can, you can... I don't think that's a, a healthy 
way to it, it might be good to help contextualize you know your your church and what it is but i don't think it's i don't think that's an excuse to not strive for better unity because that's what god calls us to right i mean Phil- philippians paul's pleading with the people to be unified one spirit one mind in in the mind of christ right in that body of christ and i think that's should be all of our goals and i think that the issues we see in the church and the diversity we are not diversity the the divisions that we see in the church the quarrels we see in the church are directly related to it, it is a direct byproduct of us not being unified in christ in one spirit and one mind like those are those are the side effects that happen when you are not because if you if you genuinely are on fire fully surrendered in christ uh, unified under one spirit, one mind, as as Paul talks about in Philippians, ninety nine percent of these issues go away. You know. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I would disagree with that, but I think I would point out that saying and kind of just going, okay, well, the reason the church today is bad is because it's divided. If it is a byproduct, like you said, if division over these things is just a byproduct, then still the problem is not the divisions itself, but it really is. It goes back to, are the people on mm. fire for God? I would agree with that. And are they centered on God? And just sitting there complaining about, look, they divided again. It's it's what they do. It will always, I, and there's not going to, I don't think, and it could be, but I don't know that there's going to be a world where suddenly, you know, every, the Anglicans and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the non-denoms all, all throw out their hands and go, let's just make one group. In fact, a group tried to do that called the Christian church, where they said, let's get everyone back together and just get, pick a couple principles. And we're going to stick to these principles. This is historical, by the way, in the late 1800s. And they said, hey, we're going to just, we're going to be the Christian church. And then it was not very long before the Christian church re- divided into a whole bunch of different denominations that we have today because it just it just doesn't work and we can say well that's human sin and that's just how it is or or, or, i'm not defeatist i'm just saying complaining about it and grumbling about it and talking about how once we were all united Mm -hmm. just is wrong this is a part of the church's legacy and and there are good things that can come from it the church at jerusalem was once very united but when they divided and spread it out that was when the gospel went out to the four corners of the earth god can use that spreading of the people and like you said it's about the hearts if you're willing to work with you're on fire for christ and working with people who love the lord you're gonna become united with the global body of christ when you're willing to make sure you say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm whatever denomination I am, but I know that there are believers in other churches and have been for a long time. And that's just how it's always been. Then you're willing to work with others. It's when you kind of can become close and say, we're the only ones that are right. And mm-hmm. everyone else needs to get on board. Or when you flip it the other way around and go, everyone's wrong. There's no hope because we're all divided. That's I think the other side too. So what I'm hearing is you you just want people to stop complaining about <laughs> about uh, yes. being divided because that's nothing new. Because the because the complaint doesn't fix the problem. Okay. What does is like you said turning to Christ and just saying God this unity can only come through you and we are united a lot more than we think we are. Yeah, I I think I think shifting the focus back I I, I think I think I'm finally starting to see you know where you're coming from. Although I would, I would never approach it from that way in my own mind. But um, it's 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 not a problem with the church. It's a problem with the hearts of the people, right? It, that's yes. that's how we're 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 looking at this. Yes. Um, and that when we try to blame it on, or or categorize it even as a, a black and white factor of just division and non-division within groups of believers, mm-hmm. what we're missing. We're missing so many elements and so many points to what what yeah. that is and and that's we oversimplify we oversimplify the the big problem or not even that we oversimplify the issue it's the the problem is the division itself when if you even in first corinthians i would argue that yes paul was very much wanting them to be united but then he spends the rest of the letter telling them all the moral issues and problems that they're doing as an entire church and like it's not just unite for the sake of unity 
you know, it's not just, well, we're, some of us are very wrong, but let's unite anyway. It's fine. Like it's unite behind these things that Christ is and the mm. church is supposed to be. And like, you know, there's a, there's something where we're uniting to, we're uniting to the, you know, what the word calls us to unite to. We're not just uniting for the sake of uniting. I don't know that Paul would have been like, okay, Paul, we all got together and we all decided that we're, you know, all going to have our father's wife together. That's, we're, we're united on that now. I don't think that Paul would have been like, well, that was a step forward. I think that would have mm-hmm. been a step back. I think he wants them to be not divided, but also unified to what is holy, what is good, and what scripture calls mm-hmm. us to be. And if we, we do that, and if, and if, you know, we, we can do that while still having maybe some differences, but we've learned to worship differently, but we're still the same church. I, I think that's not a big deal. I think yeah. we put it too much on the names and the labels and we need to step back and realize it's the holy calling the Bible is calling us to. That's what we're supposed to unite to. We're not supposed to unite just for unity's sake. Yeah. And I think the, the important takeaway here, and I think what, what is interesting is you, unity involves multiple people right you can't be unified with other people if it's just you right and we we kind of talking through this have established that unity comes when you are you when you are uh motivated by surrendered to life in christ and 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 turned over to what god is is driving you to but that only works you know that only unifies you with someone else who also is surrendered to Christ and is also pursuing God with all their heart. Um, and so you can't be unified as a church if there's people in your church that aren't surrendered to God, you know? That's that's where the issue comes, and that's where the focus comes. I, I think churches that struggle with unity need to focus more on the individual spiritual walk with God because that's where yeah. resolution is going to come. That's where... Uh, when 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 Paul calls the church of Philippians to be unified in one spirit, that's because he knows that individual spirits, you know, individual viewpoints are never going to line up. You're always going to have uh, dissension um, amongst the people. It's only once we're all on the same page in Christ spirit that that unity can exist. And so it doesn't come back to legislation. It doesn't come back to... Uh, you know, different rules to make or different, uh, uh, you know, amendments to the church's constitution or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. It just comes back to the hearts of the individual. Um, man, Troy, have you, uh, have <laughs> you, uh, uh, are you aware of Francis Chan's new book, Until Unity? No, I have not read that one. I'm not, I'm not aware It just of came one. out this past <laughs> year, um, but it is fascinating. And Troy actually... I think you would find it really interesting because uh, so it, it's it's all about this topic. It's all about unity in the church. Francis Chan, you know, he's, he's hardcore about uh, unity, and and uh, he actually breaks down. Uh, you know, like we mentioned on the top show, people kind of wonder where we're at theologically and stuff like that. Troy and I've always wondered, like, where does Francis Chan land the- theologically on a lot of topics? Uh, it's something, especially because like he kind of seems to bounce all yeah. over. Where one minute he's like over here, and then the next minute, whoop, he's yeah. over there, and then over there. In so, this, I, in this uh, book, he literally has a chapter where he literally just lays out like every theological topic and a percentage of how hmm. sure he is about a certain viewpoint about it. It's fantastic. It's great. He's literally just like, okay, here's what the the Eucharist. I'm 95 percent sure that this is not the blood of Christ, or like just going down like yeah. every theological thing. And his whole point is, uh, very few of these things are 100 percent. You know, like like he he, he was mm-hmm. he was talking about how um, we fight about things that we aren't even 100 percent sure of ourselves, type of thing in that chapter specifically. Mm-hmm. But I did find it really interesting to see him go into town on like, you guys want to know what I believe? Here's all of the topics, and here's a percentage of how <laughs> sure I am about my viewpoint mm-hmm. on it at the moment. Um, but he has a, a, I don't know if I call it like a thesis, a premise in that book that he proposed that I found was really interesting. But his kind of uh, in one of the chapters, he his whole argument, and he does a good job of kind of explaining it. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it, but uh, is the idea that uh, quarrels in the church and division in the church is specifically because of lukewarm Christians in the church. 
uh, and that's kind of his his mantra is that not only are lukewarm Christians causing pain in the church uh, and hurting the church long term, but that it is like the devil is specifically using them as a tool to stop the church from progressing and stop the church from being effective and driving generations away from the church because you know kids these days they're looking at the church and they're seeing hypocrites or they're seeing gossip and they're seeing things that are not uh what they're being taught in the church and they're turning their back on the church and that this is you know a a deliberate strategic orchestration by the adversary to to cripple the church in america is by uh Mm -hmm. these lukewarm christians in the church that are uh, taking up the vast majority of seats in the church, but not not hot Christians, you know, as opposed to a lukewarm Christian. There, there are people that are just there in church doing the motions, but uh, you know, a lukewarm Christian's going to have his own thoughts, his own agenda, his own desires. You know, when it comes to church topics, when it comes to how the daycares run, when it comes to how children's churches run, when it comes to the type of games that, you know the kids play and stuff like that. Um, or the type of songs they sing and stuff like that. Uh, When people's selfishness is able to creep in, then the cracks of the church start to form and separate the people of the church. And uh, that doesn't happen with with people that are on fire for Christ because there's that unity in, uh, in their calling to Christ. And so... He explains it way better, um, but but that was, I don't know, that's kind of what I've been kind of thinking of off and on as we go through this is like, what if, yeah, what if uh, the, I don't know, I guess my takeaway is there are a lot of problems with being a lukewarm Christian, you know, and the thought yeah. of, could I inadvertently be driving people away from the church unknowingly because... I am selfish at times when it comes to, or, or I'm a gossip sometimes at church or something like that. That, that was kind of a neat thought that I had not have had before uh, reading that book. So yeah. definitely worth checking out. Um, I feel like maybe one of his more See, controversial books to date, but, um, even, even, uh, even the name Francis Chan, there are people yeah. who, some people will hear that and immediately say, I'm not going to touch that with a stick because of who oh, it is. People that people hear that Chan, and go, yeah. Oh, I need to get that latest book. And so you let you left me with so many thoughts. So I'm going to share a few of them real quick. <laughs> um, the first one is you said, where does quarreling come from with selfishness? I mean, and that is what James 4, 1 says, why does there quarreling among you? It's because of selfishness. If selfishness is partially the reason for lukewarm Christianity, then there you go, right? right. Like that absolutely, I think, is like a part of that reason why why are people lukewarm? Because they, you know, don't want to change. They don't believe. But it's all kind of ties back to self. So I think there's something to that. Um, I, but... But I, I I am careful. And this actually, I told you, I want to make this maybe the next revived conversation. I think that um, what he's saying could lead to this idea that basically that I've heard many, many people say, and I really want this to, I really, if, you th- if the, you're listening to this episode and thought I had a weird but kind of out there opinion, I have a much weirder and out there opinion for you next time, which is this idea that persecution um, kind of brings the church together by getting rid of the tares, you know, the, the weak ones and the lukewarm as the church kind of gets rid of them, it becomes more united on fire for Christ. And I really think that historically that has not been the case and has sometimes perhaps been the case, but historically it will save it for another episode. But if that, that, that thinking has been the groundwork for a lot of that kind of thinking. And I really want to get to that episode because I think that we you may change some, what do you maybe do? change you some minds. You can drop the, that, uh, such no, a controversial that stop a, topic. That is a hook, and if you heard me right now and you okay, thought okay. I don't like well, what you I have just a, said, an immediate you wait rebuttal to your to your hook. You're, so you're saying that persecution does not always result in uh, absolutely a better church. Yeah, I so yes. so yes, historically that's absolutely true. There's been churches that have just gone extinct because because of persecution. But I think, again, you're, the way you approach these topics is just so odd in my mind. It's not, I don't think that the persecution 
guarantees that a church is going to be stronger. I think it's if you can survive through persecution, you are stronger because of it. No, many people believe that. Even that. Okay, save save this for that episode, Joel. We are going to get into because that. you're forced. Um, you're forced anyway. to to you're forced to believe something, right? I mean, if you're being persecuted and you're not 100 percent on board, then you're not gonna you're not gonna go through a lot of pain to support something that you don't believe. So when you are in pain, when you are when it is extremely inconvenient for you, you're going to have to decide what is worth holding to. And so by default, those that faith is stronger because it's been forced to give a result compared to other people that live posh lives that never have to uh, commit one way or another specifically. Does that make sense? That's, that's, that's what they're saying when they say <laughs> persecution leads to stronger faith. Save it for the episode, oh Joel, because I definitely have a response, but I cannot give it all in this episode. We gotta wrap save this it for then. Up. If you heard, I know we got to wrap this one up. So if you if you heard that and you're you're just wait, I will explain. I'll explain my perspective, and then you can hate me afterwards. But coming at it from a church history perspective, like I do this, like I do a lot of things where I just look at the history of the church, I have to say that it just. It, it, well, I'll explain it oh, then. Boy. So anyway, um, back to this unity topic. I, but overall, yes, I think it's just we need to focus more on our relationships with Christ. We need to focus more on who are the Christian believers we can work with and focus maybe a little bit less on and, and, and not put so much guilt, not put this bear on, not put this burden on ourselves that, oh, we have to find a way to beat back on this division that is so unique to our own time, but just acknowledging the real out the reality is the church has always been fractured and and it reminds me okay so you said that lukewarmness is what causes this yeah sometimes and, and sometimes it's just human misunderstanding so really interestingly um the, the greek orthodox church and the western roman catholic church did not for a long time like the eastern like the church of the far east but when people have kind of gone back and done some research especially on this one theologian abby the great who wrote a ton of stuff that they didn't have the proper translations of his work. And so the Syrian word that he was using for kind of like describing who the Trinity is, when they translated it back to Rome and back to Constantinople, they thought he meant one thing. And what the Syrians people understood him to mean was something else. And for the longest time, there was this huge divide because they thought that the the people on one side of the spectrum thought this guy was a heretic. And the people on the other side of the spectrum were like, we're using your, like literally we have St. Augustine's writings. Like we're using, his writings to come up with some of these ideas like why are you so upset with us and so sometimes it's lukewarm christianity but sometimes it's just an aspect i think of living in a fallen world where even something like linguistics and language can cause division inadvertently because we are in a broken fallen world and it just it is just going to require jesus christ to supernatural the fact that any two christians are able to unite The fact that any two humans can unite on something for God, it's so hard for one Christian to walk with God, let alone two can come together in his name and agree and worship and have communion is in and of itself kind of a miracle. Like when you think about it, the fact that there can be whole bodies of the church that can come together, hundreds of believers can come together is actually an incredible thing. And I think sometimes we are like, man, this needs to be perfect. And it's like, let's, why don't we just thank God and be a little bit more grateful for the unity that we do have, actually, because realistically, like without Jesus Christ giving us the unity that we currently have, we wouldn't have it. Let's be, let's be, try to turn it around off of guilt and maybe turn it towards gratefulness. That's, that's my perspective. I think that's an, an okay, <laughs> an okay place to leave it. I still don't think necessarily we see, I mean, I, again, I see where you're coming. Um, and I think our, our, uh, practical, applications are are the same in that you know it comes let's focus on the individuals and stop complaining so much about um what's around us because we uh need to like that 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 who we are and how we specifically interact with the people around us um is where that change is going to happen and that comes with how in step we are with the spirit or not um yeah interesting i do love that the episode on unity is the most (laughs) most divisive we've we've ever ever been been. on air yeah (laughs) That's fun. Until so, next well, I hope, conversation, we'll see. Yes, there you go. I hope that this episode was edifying to you. If if it wasn't, I apologize. If you thought this was a mess, okay, I was, I apologize for that too. But I hope at least it kind of opened the conversation and maybe opened some I, some some doors in your mind. Maybe maybe considered some thoughts from different perspectives. I think there are a lot of unity on the, in the church 
podcast episodes, but if nothing else, this will be the one that you go, well, that was a different way to approach that. And, uh, and maybe that will help, help you bring up some new solutions for where you're looking. Yeah. I don't think anyone on the internet has, has, has a, (laughs) a statement quite like your opening argument there, but uh so yeah okay. adding something to the internet a bit unique uh thank you there you go <laughs> everybody for <laughs> listening to this episode of revive thoughts uh, like i said we got plans for more revive conversations down the road um feel free to write us uh so you you might be uh, in agreement with one of us or you might be fuming at uh, specifically troy but uh feel free to, <laughs> to write in and let us know revive thoughts at gmail.com or you can message us on our socials we love to we love to hear from you yeah, and I look forward to uh, explaining my theory on why the persecuted church does not always lead to growth for the church. And I look forward to uh, demonstrating that for you all. And I look forward to you all, uh, some of you not liking it and some of you liking it. So that'll <laughs> be fun. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. You see a need? You have a solution. Now you're looking to start your own nonprofit to spark positive change in your community. Follow your passion with a Master of Public Administration at Cornerstone University. Study practical curriculum to launch your nonprofit with confidence and learn in a way that fits your schedule as a busy adult, whether online or live stream. The MPA is expected to launch in September 2021. Visit adult.cornerstone.edu slash MPA to learn more.